Well, so my name is Suresh Venkatesuran. I'm a professor at the University of Utah, and I think about technology and society. Um, you've just watched this great, you know, uh, movie on uh, gerrymandering. And of course, it's been around since, as we saw in the movie, since, well, since gerrymander. And I think what we saw in this movie was that gerrymandering has been around for a long time, but that when you take gerrymandering and combine that with technology in the form of maps redrawn using careful profiling, it kind of rocket boosted gerrymandering on the cheap to give you sort of very, very intricate drawings like the one we just saw in the movie. And and the problem, of course, with all of this is that the technology works in the shadows and obscurity. Something that could, on the surface, be a neutral algorithm for doing redistricting might have really bad outcomes that aren't apparent until it's too late. And so, well, you know, I'm here to tell you that it's only going to get worse. And this is even if the census numbers, you know, play out correctly, people are able to respond to census and legislatures, including ours, <clears throat> allow for independent redistricting to work. And what I want to do is take you through a series of looming disasters that, you know, even assuming ger there is no gerrymandering, are still likely to cause problems with voting. And in fact, sadly, are already causing problems. So it's not even a future I'm talking about, but a future that's here now. So if you think of the stages that go into casting a ballot for someone, there's, you know, of course, redistricting, uh, but there's also voter selection. Who is allowed to make that choice to vote? And there's voter persuasion. Who wants to actually go and vote? Because you know, it takes some effort to go and do it, and not everyone does. And then there's, of course, once you've you know, decided who gets to vote, and once you've decided to make your option to vote, uh, how do you go to make that vote? Right? What, what are the options available to you? And so while you know, the focus on redistricting is important, and it's critical to make it independent and fair, it's only one part of the process. And so what I'm gonna to try to do is briefly walk you through these three stages that come after the redistricting and see where they could go horribly wrong and where in some cases they already are going horribly wrong. So let's talk about who gets to vote. You know, it seems straightforward enough. If you're a citizen above the age of 18, you should be able to vote, right? Well, you know, not so much. In many states, for example, you can't vote if you're currently incarcerated or even if you're on parole. And um, this is something that, you know, there's a lot of reform around and they're trying, you know, whether you may or may not, you know, you may, we may have a disagreement over whether people who are in jail or not should vote, but assuming that, you know, there is a desire to get everyone who can vote to vote, there's a lot of effort to allow this. For most recent example of this is in Florida where a year or two ago, uh, convicted felons were allowed to vote for the first time once they complete the sentences. So let's put on the mindset of someone who's trying to prevent people from voting. Right. So suppose you're trying to ensure that groups of people who might not otherwise vote for your team um, aren't allowed to vote. You can't you know, be blatantly partisan or racist about it, then you'll get caught. You have to somewhat do it more cleverly. And you already have from the redistricting days, even though you can't do gerrymandering anymore, pretty good models to understand how someone might vote. Right? You have a way to predict how someone might vote. So now, Instead of looking at where people live and trying to read our districts so that you know, your districts are carved out in a way that you, know, you get the votes you want, you look for other factors that might predict how people might vote. Let's say you, you, know, you realize that certain areas where your voter base has a much higher income than the, uh, your, and, and the other side has voters who are, say, poorer. What do you do then? Well, in this case, you could do something like poll taxes, right? It's, it seems you know, totally innocuous on the face of it. Please pay your debts to the state before being allowed to vote again. But it's optimized this policy, which looks neutral on the face of it, to affect different people differently so that the wrong people, wrong and for your team, don't get to vote. And this is not the only way this can happen. Again, once, you're allow, once you have algorithms that can fine tune uh, and, and identify key features in people's profiles that might be able to predict how they'll vote, there are other factors you can use. For example, you might decide that, um, that younger voters don't wanna vote for you. So you find ways to block them from voting, right? You can put in rules about voter IDs, things that again, seem very reasonable on the face of it, but will disproportionately affect groups of voters who tend to be moving around a lot, who may not be able to register in the state that they're studying in and so on. Or you might find that in some key constituencies, disabled voters, the key swing vote, swinging the election to your opponent. So you make it harder for them to access polling booths. Again, it might seem reasonable on the face of it, but what it has is differential effect on different groups of people. And you can do this again with technology once you have information about people's backgrounds, their demographics, other features, and how that might predict who they'll vote for. And so this micro-targeting 
assisted by technology is something we're probably going to see more of. Right now, it's still pretty blunt edged the way gerrymandering used to be, but it's probably going to get much more subtle over time. So it's not enough that people can vote and in the right district. They have to want to vote. You know, clearly everyone here watching this uh, movie and listening to me is very highly motivated to vote. But nationwide, only about 60% of the eligible voting population actually ends up voting. And this is sort of historically fairly stable over the past you know, 70 years. It fluctuates a little bit for so much. And just by comparison, if you look at say Western Europe, the average turnout is 83%. It's much higher. So 60% so is not something you would say as well, that's how it normally is. It's not, it's just normal in the US. And so what that means is that if you, even if your team espouses unpopular positions, you can still win elections just by convincing more people from the other team not to vote, right? And of course, the easiest way is to, you know, gerrymander seats. So there's no doubt about an election result that, you know, that works because people no longer believe their vote counts anymore. Uh, Utah, for example, has a very low um, overall turnout rate compared to other states in the country. Um, I wonder why. And, but what if you're an exciting swing state, not Utah, where it's clear that every vote does count? How do you then convince people not to vote? Well, the trick here is this. So let's say you know, you're know you on the green team and you have you know, unpopular policies that most people don't support. It's the yellow team has more you know, policies. And if, in, if you had a straight up vote of all the people who are eligible to vote, your team would lose. But if you could somehow convince a bunch of people from the yellow team not to vote at all, suddenly you win. So rather than trying to convince more people of the effectiveness of your policies, you just try to discourage people from the other side. How do you do that? Well, of course you do that with social media. So you can use social media of various kinds, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, what have you, to specifically micro-target messages uh, that look one way to voters you want to encourage. So you might target, you know, people who you believe will vote the way you want them to and target positive message, encouragements to vote, encouragements about the candidates, good feel good messages. And on the other hand, you can target the other uh, team with messages that are discouraging, the messages that you know, so confusion, that's so cynicism, that suggests that there's no point in voting, that even if their candidate got elected, they wouldn't get what they wanted. And just turn off a few people. And you don't have to do it a lot. You just have to do it enough that people won't vote. And we saw this happen, you know, uh, we've seen this happen already. The Senate Intelligence Committee report um, mentioned that this, these uh, Russian sort of agencies that were trying to foment confusion and cynicism used essentially Facebook and uh, Twitter and other formats to discourage people from voting. Um, we've seen that this happen. There was a report on this from the Miami Herald about how this was done in 2016 to discourage uh, black communities from voting. Uh, we're seeing this happen right now. This is an article from a few days ago uh, using Spanish language disinformation uh, to discourage Latinos in Florida from voting. And the, the most diabolical thing about this stuff is that you will never see it. If you're not part of the group that's being targeted, you won't see it because you won't see those ads. So it'll be very hard for you to know that these kinds of ads are being spread out there. It's, these are target, micro-targeted towards specific communities in specific areas. And this is already happening. And I can easily see, uh, imagine more of this going to happen in the future. So, you know, maybe you have independent registering commissions, maybe you have all the IDs and paperwork you'll need to vote, and maybe you have this font of enthusiasm, just like this here, that washes away all the cynicism about democracy gumming up your thinking. Great. All you need to do then is vote. So how do you vote? Well, here in Utah, we're actually pretty advanced, right? We have easy access to mail-in ballots. Uh, we have access to drop boxes and polling stations. Yes, I've already voted. I went to that polling station with the drop box you see right there in that picture, and I put my ballot in. It was great. It was my first time, actually. So it was even more fun. But many states don't really have a well-established mail-in ballot system. So many people have to vote at, in person at polling stations. Now, voting takes time. You have to check in. Someone has to make sure you can vote at that location. You have to go into the booth and decide if you haven't already made your decisions. So if a lot of people show up to vote at a location, you'll all have to stand in line. The more people show up, the longer lines might end up being. And maybe some people just don't have the time to show up and wait in line for hours. So now you're thinking, okay, how do I get people not to vote? This is how you do it. Make it harder for people from the other team to vote. Maybe you don't put down enough polling stations, or maybe you limit the use of ballot drop boxes in places where you know there are lots of people who vote for the other team. Maybe that'll make them vote lo wait longer to vote. 
and maybe that'll dissuade some of them from voting. It's actually really easy to do this with algorithms. Look at this picture right here. So let's say there's a green team and a red team, and the green team is trying to find a way, even though there are fewer of them, to get more votes. Well, here's one thing you could do. You could place more polling locations in the green area where, in, where there's more you know, green voters and arrange, again, if you're in charge of polling, to place a fewer polling locations where there are more red voters. So now there is access to vote. On the surface, it looks perfectly reasonable, but it's gonna take longer for people in the red dominated areas to vote. And maybe, just maybe, some of them will be turned off. And in, in places where you have small margins of victory, you don't need to do this for too many people. And that's the thing. Now, of course, it'll, it'll look really suspicious if polling stations suddenly vanish, but there are all these pretexts, you know, voter security, the pandemic, and so on. And we're already seeing many suspicious policies around polling station. You've, you've probably heard of what's been happening in Georgia. And this is, again, uh, differentially different between large urban areas with many non-white voters and so on. We're seeing this happen in Texas, where you know, counties are being limited to one absentee ballot drop-off location, even though some counties are much bigger than other counties. Um, no surprise where some of the big counties are, especially in urban areas in Texas, which tend to skew one way or the other. So all of this is very depressing, right? Uh, I mean, I did want to depress you a little bit because I wanted to sort of emphasize that the story is not over once, you know, once we're able to address gerrymandering. But you know, I don't want to leave you feeling totally despairing about this. There is some hope. And what should we do? I first should say that you know, many of the examples I showed involving what's happening right now appear to be from one party only, and that's unfortunately more or less the case right now. But it's not you know, unreasonable to think that a different party would want to consolidate its hold on power in the future. Right? As we saw in the case of Michigan, what's really important is that the key steps on the road to voting and democracy have to be taken out of the hand of the parties altogether. The team shouldn't get to make the rules of the game. So for gerrymandering, independent redistricting commissions are a great step, and we'll have to watch carefully to make sure they're truly independent and truly doing districting based on neutral principles. But what about the other issues? Well, here's some sort of things I will help you sort of think about. Just think about this this way. Be very skeptical about claims of for the need for policies that restrict who gets to vote. More often than not, these claims are based on claims about voter fraud. And while voter fraud can happen, it's so far a very, very small problem. And it's only ever really trotted out as something that needs to be solved when people want to make it harder to vote. There's no reason why registering to vote has to be such a burden. And there's no reason to block anyone from voting if they have the right to. So broadly speaking, keep an eye out for attempts to restrict who gets to vote and push back hard because there's always some kind of hidden agenda. And with algorithmic targeting, it may not be apparent at first glance what that hidden agenda is. It might look neutral on the face of it. Voter suppression works, of course, when people aren't motivated to vote. 2020 looks like it'll be a banner year for voter turnout, and that's great. But can you all honestly say that you know, the same will happen in 2022 or 2024? I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm always skeptical. But no matter how unhappy you are with your candidate, allowing yourself to consider not voting means you are now a target, a target for disinformation campaigns that really want you to not show up. Your vote actually does matter, no matter what these campaigns will say. So just like we have to be very careful and judicious with what kind of information we've been seeing about the pandemic on social media, we have to be careful in general, because there are groups out there that are actively trying to spread disinformation around voting. And finally, advocate for policies that make it easier to vote. Remember, voter fraud isn't as much of an issue as a way to limit voting. It's not easy to implement the different strategies for voting. You know, mail-in voting has issues that need to be dealt with carefully, uh, drop boxes, early voting, and so on. These are all problems that need to be solved, but they have been solved. In fact, we know this from Utah, that these problems can be solved. It is possible to allow multiple ways for people to vote and do it safely and do it accurate, way in a way it can be done accurately and then preserve the integrity of our elections. There is no reason not to do that. And so I'll leave you with that thought that, you know, as we go forward, expect to see the way in which technology is used to subvert democracy get far more subtle. Um, so you need to be aware, keep your eyes open, keep in mind that, you know, policies that look neutral may not be. And um, always, you know, tend towards supporting policies that open up that allow more people to vote, that allow more ways to vote, rather than trying to restrict. Thank you all. Thank you.